Good morning, Cornerstone family. We are so glad you're joining us for Church Online. Whether you're tuning in from out of town, in the car, or from your home in the Kansas City area, we're so glad you're joining us in worship. Thank you for bringing the church online. I have a few announcements to share with you this morning. This year's Easter hunt a trunk is coming up this Saturday, April 1st from 11 to 12.30. We'll have food, an inflatable obstacle course, soft pretzels, an exotic animal petting zoo, rows of decorated car trunks with candy-filled eggs, face painting, and even a visit from Slugger. Families who RSVP will be entered into a raffle. Consider signing up to serve to help make this event a success. All information is at cornerstoneks.org slash huntatrunk. To help plan for this event, we're collecting wrapped bite-sized candy and plastic Easter eggs as our March mission focus. Grab a bag in the lobby and bring the bag back anytime this month. Thank you for your donations. It's officially the start of spring, which means Easter is around the corner. We have many different ways to engage in worship during Holy Week. On Friday, April 7th at 7 p.m., the Cornerstone Music Ministry will present their annual Easter concert. Please reserve your seat online at cornerstoneks.org concert. And then on April 9th, Easter Sunday, join us in worship either in person at 9 a.m. for our traditional service or at 11 a.m. for our modern service or right here on YouTube at 10 a.m. as we celebrate our risen King. As always, these announcements and other resources can be found by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here at Cornerstone. Good morning, church. Join me for our call to worship from Psalms 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Let's continue in worship this morning.
you join with me for our confession of sin? Most gracious Father, we acknowledge and confess that we are prone to evil and lazy in doing good. All our shortcomings and offenses are against you. You alone know how often we have sinned by wandering from your ways and wasting your gifts and in forgetting your love. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Teach us to hate our sins and cleanse us from our secret faults. Forgive all our sins on account of your dear Son, our Savior. Send your purifying grace into our hearts, that we may live in your light and walk according to the commandments of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, church, hear this assurance of pardon coming from Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. God, thank you for today and each day that we draw breath, Father, that you have given us purpose in life. Would you bless us as we might be even going through sufferings, Father, that, that we might be having troubles, that our hearts might be broken, Father. Would you use our brokenness for you, God? Would you use our suffering for your glory and your will, Father? We know that often our greatest sufferings might become our greatest ministries, Lord. So bless us in those. Wherever we're joining from today, Lord, would you use this service, God, for your glory? Would you use us people as we give, Lord, and as you use us as different pieces of the body? Would you use us to be glorifying to you, to spread your message and your love, Lord, so that people might know Jesus when they see us, Father, when they see us out in the world. Whoever we are, Lord, whatever part of the body that we are, Lord, we are reflective of you and of what Christ has done, the love that he's given us so freely, Father, that we have not earned. We love you, Lord. Use this day. And teach us to pray, Father, as well. Praying as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. that are consumed with worry and anxiety. In 2019, the World Economic Forum stated that there are roughly 275 million people that are suffering from anxiety around the world. Now, that was in 2019, and now today they would say it's probably close to 350 million people are suffering from worry and concern that affects their daily life. Now, when you begin to think about what it does and the impact that it has on our culture, think about what it does to our daily life, what it does to our routine, and what worry and concern can bring to us into our heart. It robs us of our life of joy that the Lord has promised to us. It even shortens our life if we allow it to in the sense that it becomes such a concern that it can make us sick mentally, spiritually, physically, all of these ways that we see that this kind of worry and concern becomes a, a problem in our culture and in this world. The World Economic Forum said about 60% of those out of the 350 million are women that are suffering from anxiety. The remainder being men at 40%. And it robs us of the joy of the daily mercies that the Lord gives to us. And so Jesus is going to speak to us in the Sermon on the Mount today and point us in a direction on how to deal with our worries, how to deal with our anxiety. He's just spoken about money, and he said, therefore, 
I don't want you to be anxious. See, we can put our trust in money and we can find that it can collapse like we found a bank did in Silicon Valley last week. And millions of people lost millions of dollars and now they're worried about their future and their concern. Their daily life has been turned upside down. And that's what can happen in the world that we live in. That's the reality of where we live and in the time that we live that we never know what tomorrow will bring. But the word of God then speaks to us and begins to help us understand and look at things differently. And what Jesus is going to do when he shows us how to deal with our worries and concerns, he wants us to think back to the very character of God, of who he is and what he's done for us. He wants us to consider those things as our songs have shown us, that we want to think about him going into the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Worried about their loss of life, but what does he do? He comes right into the middle. And not a hair was burned on their body. Or going back to the time of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea, and the song alludes to Jesus holding back the water. And we begin to think about what God has done for his people over and over again. And all these stories that the scriptures show, share with us and give to us are reminders of who we are to put our trust in. And Jesus wants us to understand that will impact the way we consider and the way we look at worries and anxiety. Archibald Hart, who was a Christian psychologist, said, anxiety is now the number one emotional problem of our day. Panic anxiety is the number one mental health problem for women in the United States and second in men only to substance abuse. I've had a panic attack before. I've had that experience of feeling that my heart is going to explode. I've had that feeling of not being able to catch my breath. I've had that experience of where I was worried about what was going to happen next. And so we think about what that can do, the challenges of what it brings to us, the fear that can be established. It affects our daily living in such a way that we might now rearrange our day based on our worries and concerns. Maybe it affects your travel, that you won't, because you have a fear of flying, that instead you'll have to figure another way out. Maybe that means you're never going off this continent in your lifetime because you'll be satisfied with that and missing the opportunity to explore the world because of the worry and concern that you've allowed to establish itself in your heart. It ruins relationships. Maybe there's a fear this afternoon that maybe you wouldn't go to Tanner's Bar and Grill with us because you have a fear or a worry about being in a large group of people. And so instead, you want to isolate yourself. And we arrange our day and the patterns of our life around the worries and the concerns that we have in this world. So Jesus wants to speak to us this morning about that, about what it can do in our life. And he wants us to think differently he wants us to understand this is what the gospel will do in us. It will remind us of what God has done for us and are calling us back to putting our trust in a heavenly father that loves you and me in such an enormous way we could never believe it to be true. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 and here he's going to unfold to us a way that we can understand how to deal with worries and concerns. It's found in verse 25. Here's the word of the Lord for you this morning. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Well, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider now the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the world, or the Gentiles, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
So instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And there on a mountainside where the people were wondering what they would do for their next meal, wondering what they would do for their night's rest, Jesus speaks these words and offers them encouragement and care and compassion. But he begins by giving us three times in less than 10 verses, he tells us these words, therefore, do not be anxious. In verse 25, do not be anxious for your life. Do not be anxious in verse 31. And then in verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow. And he's unfolding for us the problem that we have, that he acknowledges in what we see in our daily life, we are people that are always worried and anxious. It's something that we're going to experience in this world, and panic attacks might be part of your life and part of your experience, but Jesus wants to give you a remedy. And he's going to give you the remedy in this verse that's found in verse 33, that we're to seek first the kingdom of God. This is what we should be doing in regard to the issues of our concerns and worries about what tomorrow may bring or what today's news will bring across our table. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God. Set him as your focus. Make him be the center of your life and you will have no worries and concerns in the sense that you know that all of these things can be brought to him. And this is what Jesus is going to unfold for us as he lays out an argument for us in these verses. So he wants you to set your eyes on Christ, to set your eyes on the cross. He wants your heart to be focused upon what God has done for you. He wants your mind to understand and to acknowledge what God gives to you and what he has done on your behalf. Because listen to what Romans chapter 8 says. Remember, that's that beautiful chapter. We said it's one of the probably the greatest chapter in all of the Bible. And maybe this afternoon you need to spend some time just meditating and reading and reflecting on what that beautiful chapter offers to you. But here's a little snippet for you. It's found in verse 31. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You see what Paul is trying to teach the church in Rome. He said, if he's given you the son, if he's given his son Jesus Christ who would come and die on the cross for you, why would you think he would not take care of everything else for you as well? He did what absolutely you needed because you needed the gospel of grace. You needed what Jesus Christ could only offer. You needed him to take your place on the cross and you needed his righteousness to be given to you. That's exactly what God has provided in the giving of his son. And Paul is saying, if he has done that for you, who can be against you? Why would you ever think that God is not on your side? Why would you think he doesn't care about what's going on in your life or the worries or the concerns that keep you up at night or the tears that you use to get yourself to bed in the evening? That the Lord is the one who will come and he has provided his son and this is a promise to you and me that he loves us so dearly that he would go to that extent to care for you and take care of your greatest need. So why would you think in all the other areas of your life that God doesn't give a rip? He's given us his son. So why wouldn't you consider that he'll give you everything else? So let's listen to his first argument that he gives. He wants you to look at your life. Verse 25, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body or what you'll put on. So let's consider our culture that we live in for a moment. Our culture is filled with the desire for pleasure. If you walk into any, any store that sells magazines, what are you going to see on the covers? You're going to see magazines about food. You're going to see magazines about beauty. You're going to see magazines about what clothing you should have. You're going to see magazines about money. All of these things, and it allures our heart to chase after them, to look like the people that are on the covers, maybe, to pursue after these things and chase and think that that will bring you the satisfaction that you 
really need in this life. Last week, the Oscars were on. Just think about this for a moment, that how many months went into preparation for some of the actors to have their red carpet watch? How much time was spent, how much money was spent in the preparation, the hair being done, the dress being picked out, and people were wearing million-dollar dresses that no one normally can have, often given by the designers for that evening's wear, not even worn by them. But what were they trying to do? To be seen on the carpet, to be accepted by the public, and hoping that maybe the picture of them on the red carpet would be on the front cover of the magazine next week. Or maybe we'd be the ones talking about them and what they wore. Did you see what they wore? Did you see what the Kardashians were wearing to the Oscars? A whole life and a whole episode of life about what they do for a living, and we all take a peek into the Kardashian home. And Jesus is saying, look at your life. Look at what you're pursuing. Alex de Tocqueville, who was a Frenchman who came to the United States in the 1800s because he had heard about what was happening on this continent. And so he came to observe what was going on. And he began to see the abundance that was here in this country. And he wrote a reflection of his interaction here and what he was able to see. And he said these words, the incomplete joys of this world will never satisfy the human heart. When he looked at the abundance that this country offered, he said the incomplete joys of this world will never satisfy our hearts. And that's what Jesus is saying in this passage of scripture to you and me. When you look at your life and you want to pursue all of these things and try to make a life from that, maybe your security, your identity, your your personality is going to be shaped by all of these things. The Lord is saying, I have provided what you truly need. All of these things, you'll find them lacking. You'll find that they only lead you to incomplete joy. And Jesus comes and tells you that he comes to offer you a life that is abundant life. Not a life held back, but a life celebrated, a life rejoicing in what God has provided. And this is what God gives to you even in the here and now. And it's a little taste of what he's giving to you in the future, in eternity. So he wants you to grasp and understand the beauty of the joy that this world can offer to you, but never have it substitute and be something that will bring you incomplete joy in this world. The things of this world will pass away and fade away, like the grass, like the flowers. But he wants you to hold on to eternity, to have eternity written in your heart so that you will have a a different perspective when the worries and the storms come into your life. So the next argument, he says, look at the birds. He wants us to go bird watching today. Look at the birds, verse 26, of the air. They neither sow nor they reap uh, nor gather into the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? So here's the second argument. He wants you to take a look at the birds. We have a bird feeder outside of our our window. We placed it there so that we could sit and eat and watch the birds come. And we sit there and take a look and we watch them gather some of the twigs and maybe some of the grasses. And we watch them build the nests in their trees in our backyard. And we have the joy of watching what a bird will do. All day they're working and they're tending and they're taking care of themselves in one sense. And the Lord is the one who provides everything for them. He's the one who provides for the worm for them. He's the one that provides the nest for them. And if God would do this for birds, how much more will he take care of you? How much more valuable are you in comparison to the other aspects of God's creation? You see, he created us at the center of his creative work. And he's saying, look, if I take care of all of these other things, why would you think I would not take care of you? Why would you think that my best is what is for you? And this is what he's trying to help us understand. God provides exactly what you need, just like he did for the birds of the air, and you are more valuable to him than all of these things. And do you truly grasp how valuable you are in the eyes of God, that he loves you and sings a song over you, that he sees you as the apple of his eye, the pinnacle of his creation? 
And he's the one who will give you purpose and meaning and identity. None of these other things will even come close. So the third argument, he goes, he says this, anxiety never gives you what you might think you need. Verse 27, and which of you can be anxious or by being anxious can add even a single hour to his span of life? He wants you to contemplate that for a moment. But think about this. We've said that being anxious and worried can diminish your life. It can shorten your life, but it can never expand your life. That's what the reality is. Worrying doesn't add one minute to your life. And he wants you to consider what God is doing. Does worrying solve your problems? Does being anxious about them do so? It's impossible. And God is helping us to understand, to look, to think, to use our eyes, to see, our mind, to comprehend. And so the fourth argument, he goes on, he says, look at the lilies. Now he wants you to look at some of the flowers that we see around us. Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So here's another argument. He wants this. These flowers, they don't fend for themselves. What is it? God provides what they need. He provides the sunshine. He provides the water. He provides the nutrients that are in the soil. He provides the bees that will come and take the pollen out of the lilies and pass it on to the others so more flowers will bloom. And we see the beauty of creation. He takes care of the working order by even how he dresses the flowers that we see in this world. Now, he makes an allusion to Solomon. Solomon was considered one of the wisest men of all time, considered one of the wealthiest men of all time. He had the opportunity to have as many garments and clothing that you can imagine. He had the ability to have the finest clothing, the finest yarns and threads, of his clothing, and he was saying, look, this lily, these flowers, have far more beauty than what Solomon had. And if God does this for the flowers of the field and for the grass that we are trying to grow in our front yard, that turns to brown that we experience right now, and we know it's coming to becoming green soon, if the Lord does that just for fun in this world, Think about how much more valuable you are. That's the point of what he's trying to say. If he takes care of the flower, what makes you think that he won't take care of you? What makes you think that when you get the news, maybe that you have an illness, maybe that you're dealing with cancer, maybe you're dealing with a loss of a loved one, what makes you think that he's not involved in the midst of all of this and that he will make something good come from the bad news that you experience in this world? Why would you doubt him? When you look at the stories of the Bible and you see how God was like a pillar of fire and a a pillar of smoke, it was a reminder that he was there in the midst of these things. He was there in the furnace. He was there in the waters. And that is the reminder of how much God cares for you and me. And look at all of history and what he's done for us and what he's provided. And if he's given us his son, why would he not take care of everything else? So what makes you doubt in him? What makes you lack trust and faith in God? That's what Jesus wants you to contemplate this morning. So he wants you to look at the flowers. He wants you to look at the birds. He wants you to look at your life. He wants you to look at the reality that anxiety and worry won't add anything to your life. Look at the world is the next argument. In verse 32, he says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. Gentiles is another word for all the nations other than the Jewish nation. And he's saying, look at the Gentiles. Walk into the grocery store. Look in your neighbor's house. Watch how people are scurrying around trying to make something of their life, hoping that it's going to bring them the joy. Think about how many people are popping pills and drinking alcohol to wash away the worries and concerns of their life. Some have even become addicted to those things, hoping that it would fill the void or the emptiness that they might experience in this world. And they're finding, we're trying to find a solution for these things. And what God is trying to share with you and me is that you have him. You have the greatest gift that has been given to you. And with him come the greatest mercies 
and an overflowing abundance of this mercy. They will be new every morning, he tells us over and over again. So why would you doubt him? Why will you have such little faith? Why is your God so small that he can't get into the big problems of your life and help you? and come alongside of you and care for you. This is the argument Jesus is trying to make. So don't be like the world in how they look at these things because they're going to put their treasures here on earth. Remember he taught us that in the last sermon. We're going to build treasures on this earth instead of heaven. And he said that if we're going to follow the world's way, he doesn't want us to do things that moth and rust will come in and destroy or thieves will come in and steal. He said, instead, build your treasures in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God. Make him be the center of your life. This is what he's trying to explain to us. Here's another argument. Look at the next one. The latter part of 32. He says, look to your heavenly father. Because you have a heavenly father who knows that you need all of these things. We have a God who is all-knowing. What that means, it means he's omniscient, meaning that everything he's able to comprehend all at the same time, he knows exactly what you need. He knows what makes you worried. He knows what makes you joyful. He knows everything that is necessary about your life. He is the one who has made you. He is infinite. He had no beginning and he has no end. We are a created being that has a beginning and an end, so we're always limited in our scope, always limited in our understanding, and God has come and revealed himself to us today. For us to understand, he is a God who will provide absolutely everything that you need. He knows it before you even know it. And Jesus wants you to hear, this is what I offer to you. I offer you absolutely everything you need. He gives you your daily bread. He's the bread from heaven that has come down out of heaven to feed your soul. Listen to Paul writing to the people in Philippi in chapter 4. He said this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything and by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you see the correlation, what he's saying? Don't be anxious. Instead, consider what he's done. Let your understanding be known that God will offer you this. He brings a peace into your life that will pass or surpass your imagination. It will bring such a joy that it will be unspeakable. You won't have enough words to describe it when you experience it. And this is what he's offering to each and every one of us. And offering it to you this morning to hear and to hold on to when you're dealing with the worries and concerns of your life. So don't be anxious for anything. Then his seventh argument, he says, look to God for mercy for today. It's found in verse 34. Yes, I skipped over verse 33. We'll go back to that in a minute. This is verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You see, what he's saying is that God will give you absolutely everything that you need for today. And when you wake up tomorrow, he's going to give you everything that you need tomorrow. And when you wake up on Tuesday, he's going to do the exact same thing over and over again. Just as the sun rises and the sun sets, God will provide new morning mercies each and every day of your life. So Psalm 23, when David had gone through the experience, he said, surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And he begins to remind you and points to these things that what God has provided for you in Christ. If you have him back to Rome, Romans 8, then you have everything that you need. If he is given to you, you have God on your side and nothing can be against you. You are now more than conquerors because of what Christ has done for you. So don't worry about tomorrow's problems today. That's what Jesus is saying in this verse. Don't worry about tomorrow's problems today. There's enough to deal with today and there will be enough tomorrow. Don't make it harder for yourself. Don't bring in more burdens. Instead, understand that you can bring your burdens to the Lord. So here's the solution he offers in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. 
all the needs that are necessary for your life, the Lord will provide. Even in the short times of life, even when you don't have plenty, he will still reign over your life with goodness and kindness and patience. And his mercies will follow you all the days of your life. So Peter said this to a young church of people who are being persecuted for following Jesus. He wrote these words, humble yourselves therefore, 1 Peter chapter 5, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You see, that's what we do as followers of Jesus. That's what he's saying in seeking the kingdom of God first. When you do that, that's taking all those worries, all those concerns, everything that bothers you, and you bring it before the Lord, and you say, Father, help me. I turn to you because you're the only one who can help me in this mess. You're the only one that can get me through this trial and tribulation. You're the only one that's able to turn evil into good and be used for my better. So cast all your anxieties on him. In 1929, the stock market crashed. J.C. Penney was one of those that had been much wealth then, and he lost everything. And it began to affect him emotionally. It began to affect him spiritually. It began to affect him mentally. And he had to go into the hospital because he was having suicidal thoughts about everything that he had lost and worried and concerned about what would come next. While he was in that hospital, he was walking the halls to help him get through the day, the long hours of being in the hospital. And when he was walking down the hallway, he heard from the chapel some pe people singing a hymn in the chapel service that was going on. And these were the words that he said or heard. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. And this lit a spark within his heart as he was walking down the hallway and he entered into the chapel and he sat down and he heard the people praying and asking God for their help and asking God for their guidance in this time. And he sat there and he heard the word of God proclaimed and preached that day. And he became a follower of Jesus as he heard the good news that would be found in him. Shortly thereafter, he was released from the hospital. He was able to overcome the worry and anxiety that had put him in there, the depression that was part of that. And the Lord worked in his life and he began to build that empire of J.C. Penney. It's on the brink of bankruptcy today, long after. But its founding was a person who heard the good news of Jesus Christ and what he offers to him. The Lord would take care of him no matter how dark it got in his life, no matter how desperate he was. And he began to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what he found in Christ is what he was looking for all along. I've encouraged you to read Dave, I mean Paul Tripp's uh, New Morning Mercies, the devotional, and here's part of what he said. One of the stunning realities of the Christian life is that a world where everything is in some state of decay, God's mercies never grow old. They never run out. They are all never all ill time. They are never, they will never dry up. They will never grow weak. They will never grow weary. They never fail to meet the need. They never disappoint. They never ever fail because they really are new every morning. Listen to what he says here. Form fitted. These mercies are form fitted for the challenges, the disappointments, the sufferings, the temptations, and the struggles that you will experience because of sin within you and the sin without you and you'll meet the mercies of God, of the Lord, each and every day. So this is why Jesus will say to you, therefore, do not be anxious about your life, about tomorrow, because you're in the hands of God. And as Ron Reno said, God's got it. And that's the message that Jesus wants you to hear. That's what Jesus is saying to you as he meets you in this moment with all your worries and your concerns. Trust me, I've got it. 
That's what Christ would give and offer to you this morning. Do you know him? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has come to speak to us this morning to offer us hope in the midst of some of our challenges of life. They've caused us to be greatly worried or even led us in times and seasons of depression in our life. We thank you, Lord, that you offer us your word to give us a new perspective, to remind us of who you are and what you've done for us and the giving of your son. Help us to understand if you've given us your son and, and the beauty of what he offers to us, how much more will you take care of everything else in our life? If you take care of the birds, then we know that you value us even more than them, then you'll take care of us. When we look at the flowers and we see their beauty and you've taken care of them, we thank you that you will take care of us. Oh Lord, help us to have greater faith. Help us to deal with the doubts in our mind that question you when your goodness has always been availing itself to us. May your love and mercy overflow in our hearts this morning. May your spirit uplift the, the broken heart today and give them encouragement in what has been said and heard from your word. For your glory's sake we pray. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. So oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me, and Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Well, we're so glad you could join us this morning as we consider what it means to be anxious and to be worrying in our life. Jesus gives us a solution. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's the solution for us to understand that when we make God the center of our life, the worries and our concerns are met with his daily mercy. And so we have the joy of knowing that God is for us and he's not against us. We, we know that God has provided everything for us in his son. And if he has done that through giving his son, how much more he will care for you and me. We need to trust the Lord with all of our life and all the details of our life, and we need to trust the Lord with all of our worries. So I hope today's word has been an encouragement to your soul, especially if you've lost sleep, especially if you've been worried and concerned about the things of this world or the things of you that are going on in your life. May you understand that the Lord will meet you 
in the moment and the Lord will provide what you need, the strength and the encouragement and the new daily mercies that he provides for each and every one of us. May the Lord bless you in the hearing of his word this morning. And would you go with great confidence in knowing that God will give you everything that is necessary to meet every trial and tribulation. Would you go now knowing that God's mercy and grace and peace from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Go and be God's church in the world this week. God bless and see you next time.